I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands in which we meet today and pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. Another reminder regarding this session that it is going to be interactive. So we are looking to ask as many questions as we can of our guests today. Uh, if you do need to ask a question via the Zoom chat function, you can do so with a screen reader by uh, using Alt-H and typing your question. Uh, you can ask a question at any point during the session. We'd love to have those flowing in. Uh, but till we, have a, till we have a start, I'm joined today by Matthew Layton. Matthew Layton is an award-winning uh, host of Studio One on Vision Australia Radio. Uh, Matthew's actually a pretty decent guy as well, but we might might get started by asking, where does Matt join us from today? How are you? Uh, hey, Jordan. I'm in Adelaide. I am uh, probably best to do a bit of audio description, really. Uh, on our screens at the moment, we have me a portly middle-aged man who hasn't had a shave for a couple of days, sitting in front of some bookcases, um, which the last owner of my house put in here, and a really disgusting orange sofa that used to belong to um, one of my friend's ex-partners, and they wanted to get rid of it because it reminded them. So I've been lumbered with it. Um, and I'm talking to Jordan Ashby, who's a, a handsome young man, who is wearing some sort of kerchief on his head because he hasn't had time to do his hair. I think that's fair, isn't it? Very fair, but you didn't bring up the point that um, the couch kind of looks a little bit out of the Cluedo playset. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure <laughs> Professor Plum in the library had a couch just like it. I, I have been referred to uh, as a professor of plums in the past. Um, <laughs> So Matthew, uh, can you uh, can you share with our listeners just a little bit about Studio One? Uh, this is very alarming, actually, because I can't hear or see anybody. Only you have access to the people we're talking to directly at the moment. Um, Studio One is Vision Australia's weekly uh, radio show, uh, in inverted commas, on life from a low vision and blind point of view. Uh, so those of you who are familiar with Vision Australia Radio already know that they spend the majority of their time, uh, I think the original plan was to level the playing field by giving people who uh, can't see well or have other reasons that reading is difficult for them, to give them access to the information that's available in newspapers and magazines. So they have a team of about 900 volunteers who provide a reading service. They uh, read aloud from the day's papers and from interesting periodicals. Um, and the theory is that this helps people who uh, have difficulty reading to, to keep abreast of modern events. Um, the radio station goes out in 11 markets as the professional radio people call them, uh, including Darwin, Perth, uh, Melbourne, Adelaide, where I am, uh, and various places in uh, regional uh, Victoria. And uh, they decided after a while, perhaps we need not only to just read to our audience, but maybe interact with them a bit as well. So they applied for funding from the Community Broadcasting Foundation. Uh, and uh, they decided to set up a, a what they, they initially planned as a national talkback program. And um, I had been in Australia for two years. I am what we call in the UK severely sight impaired. Unfortunately, over here, the term for it is low vision, which is <clears throat> kind of not really melodramatic enough for, for my liking. And I've been over here, I'm a, a trailing spouse. My wife got a job in Australia a number of years ago. And I was basically, after 20 years of a career in London, uh, in radio, I um, found myself over here basically being a house husband, which was great. I got to spend time with my twin daughters when they were six, seven, eight years old. Uh, but I'd struggled to find a job. And one day in December, 2019, I, I found a job on a radio website that it said, uh, it's quite an unusual specification. They said, we need somebody who's got experience of commercial radio uh, and community radio. And the twain never normally meet, but I had worked in commercial radio and am passionate 
for that community radio. And I uh, went, okay, this is interesting. This is probably going to be based in Sydney and I can't really do it. Can be based, based in Melbourne or Adelaide. Okay, this is interesting. Maybe I can get this one. And then it said something I've never seen in a job ad before, which is applications from candidates with a vision impairment are encouraged. And at that point, I spent two weeks going, don't stuff it up, don't stuff it up, don't stuff it up. But the word I used was not stuff, let's put it that way. Um, and I got the job and started in January 2020. I went, great, I'm out of the house. Finally, I get to interact with some people. Uh, five weeks in, back at home on my own again. Um, but uh, that didn't stop me. The technology is such that I can I can make good radio from my front room, my the, the library as we call it here, uh, as my my nine year old daughter calls it. And um, uh, yeah, we have made some good shows, I think. And um, both the Community Broadcasting Association Awards and the Australian Podcast Awards thought so as well, because in the first year. Uh, we won an award at each ceremony, which blew me away. It's like buses. You wait 20 years and there are none, and then two come along at once. It's a good point too. And beating along the way, I believe you, did you, well, we've had Dr. Carl come and speak to us. Did you beat Dr. Carl? And who was the other person? Was it? Uh, I owned Dr. Carl. We, 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 we ranked higher than both Dr. Carl and the Hack. In the Australian Podcast Awards, um, we, we beat both the hack and Dr. Carl. So we were playing against some pretty big players. And the, the aim of the show, the job description was make something that provides information or useful services to people who are living with blindness or low vision and make a mainstream entertainment product. And as much as that sounds impossible, because of the well, the nature of the people we've been talking to, um, the people who, who perhaps, every, everybody's experience of blindness or low vision is different. I've no, learned to predicate everything I have said with that, but as a bunch, we're quite thoughtful and creative people. So um, uh, I, I think because of the guests we've had on the show, who we've had some big names, but more important to me are the people who have stories to tell uh ordinary folks like you and me jordan um we've been able to make some really good radio and and i think it has given insight to people uh, in a mainstream audience but also i think the way it's been most useful to me personally is actually talking about some of those things that we all go through that we perhaps push the emotions down a little bit on um, and just to have a good old guess about whether it, whether it be um, I've got more flexible ankles than most people I know because I trip over more or do you worry what you look like or don't you just every now and again have a day where you want to hit the wall um, all of those shared experiences I think have been well, I've certainly, I've certainly been paid to have therapy. It's great. Um, but I, I think those are of interest as a shared experience to people who are living with low vision or blindness, but also um, I think have provided an insight to people who uh, do not live with such conditions, the normals, as I'm not allowed to call them. Uh, I think it's given them some insight into to what it means to be blind or low vision in an entertaining way an informative way and you kind of touched on it there uh matt in regards to some of the names that you've sort of interviewed recently in fear of sounding somewhat primitive at doing the job that you do so well uh let's let's throw a couple of questions just in regards to uh when you started in your role who was the who was the person you sat across the interview table at and said i'm going to get this person to speak to me do you know what? It was Naz K. 
Campanella, <clears throat> the ABC uh, disability correspondent and Triple J newsreader. She's a phenomenal person um, and uh, has done a really good job, not only reporting on the Disability Royal Commission, um, but also the way she reads the news on Triple J is astounding. She, she has, and I couldn't do it. I've got 20 years of experience and it's one of the things that I just don't understand how her brain works and can compute it. So she is uh, vision impaired to a degree where she can't actually read a script. So what she does is she has an auto-generated computery type voice uh, whispering in her right ear uh, as she broadcasts. And then she repeats in tones and, and puts passion into uh, the, the words that are coming out of the computer uh, as uh, live on the radio in front of millions of listeners. So when we got her, that was amazing. And, and she, again, I was excited about that, but the, the, the message underlying what she does and the passion she has to help people uh, who have submitted um, uh, evidence to the Disability Royal Commission, the, the seriousness and passion with which she took that I found to be humbling as well. Um, the interesting thing, Jordan, is, is when, when I did the interview for the job, uh, uh, they said, well, what should a, a radio show for blind and low vision people be like? And I said, well, it should be good, nay, brilliant. If you think of the things that, if you think of the brand of low vision or blindness, um, what are the cliched things we're famous for? And the answer is a really good shave, uh, eating in a restaurant in the dark, which is a, you know, it's a premium experience, one of those, those sensory deprivation restaurants. And, Stevie Wonder, uh, he's quite good at what he does and has, has been doing it very well since 1962. And people are aware that he's vision impaired, but that doesn't hinder what he does. Then the next question from one of the, the panel of a steer vision Australia people was, so who would you like to interview on your show? I went, oh, Stevie Wonder. Um, that hasn't happened yet. Um, but we're certainly working our way towards it. I've spoken to some amazing musicians over the last couple of years. Um, in fact, the, this week's show uh, is an interview with a Nigerian musician uh, called Cobbins Osokwa. Uh, and he is a, a, a hit in his own country and has, has recently written a song that puts into basic English, the messages that we all need to know to stay safe during COVID. Uh, and it's it bundled up with a catchy tune and some positivity. So it's been brilliant. Uh, also, um, <clears throat> and again, not, not showing too much behind the curtain, but uh, I'm indebted to a certain person not too far away for helping me to get a, a, an interview with uh, Casey Harris of the Ex Ambassadors. He is living all of our rock and roll dream. He is the keyboard player in a band who are currently getting 10 million listens on Spotify uh, per month. And uh, he, just talking to him was fantastic. And he, he's talking to him about being, growing up, being a teenager, it's hard enough uh, when you've got spots and you're worried about how popular you are and your body is changing and you've got to study for exams, but throw into that a vision impairment. Uh, and yes, we, we had a, a good chat about that. And um, yeah, fan, fantastic people that I'm meeting along the way. And as I say, a little bit of a thank you there to you, Jordan, for helping me get that one. It's amazing. So just in regards to some of the other people that you've interviewed recently, is there someone you've interviewed recently that you thought you wouldn't like and ended up loving? 
Uh, the first man ever to climb Mount Everest, the first uh, who's uh, totally blind, a guy called uh, Eric Wienmeyer. I don't know, I, I, I get to speak to Paralympians occasionally. And my relationship with sport and physical activity is not a good one. Uh, back in the 1970s, there was a choice that my parents faced was do we send him to a specialist educational establishment or do we bung him in mainstream education and my mum very wisely went nope we're, we'll send him mainstream uh, and that meant uh, I had to stand up next to the blackboard I'm sure that's an experience common to many of the people here but also when it came to sport I was always the kid who got picked last. And um, I then graduated from school, moved on to university, and I thought, oh, this is just some quite geeky people here. Um, maybe I could set up a five-a-side football game for people who got picked last at school. I got picked last. Uh, so when I'm confronted with the Jess Gallagher's and the, the Matt Levy's, the medal winning Paralympians, and indeed my new co-host and producer, Sam Rickard, who's a, a bronze medal winning Paralympian, 800 meters. Uh, they all irritate me slightly, to be honest. Uh, yeah, well done you with your fantastic achievements, but frankly, it wasn't really on my list and your evangelical attitude to sport and physical achievement can rub me the wrong way. And I think that's something I share, certainly from the feedback I've had with some of the people who listen to the show who've been through similar stuff to me. And the bloke who climbed Everest, Eric uh, Wienmeyer, he was I really wanted to be irritated with him. Uh, I really wanted not to like him for showing off and making me look bad for what I hadn't done with my life. But he was such a charming and positive person uh, who uh, batted back my occasional crotchety questions with nothing but genuine positivity, I think. Um, I, it's, but it's not all about the big guests, Jordan. That's what I'm saying. Um, we've had some other shows that again confront stuff that people look like last the week before last was what do you look like last week was about cooking we had two chefs on one of whom was uh 25 years old and has been working as a professional chef in spite of the fact he's legally blind and talked about all the hurdles he'd overcome uh, and the other one probably familiar to some of the people here today is uh, vision australia's own semi-tame uh, celebrity chef Tony Broom, who is a master. Tony lost his sight about 12, 14 years ago for medical reasons we don't need to go into here. Uh, and he was back in the 80s and 90s, he was Mr. Flombe. He would, you could find him on demonstration stages all across Australia and actually on television, basically setting all the food groups on fire in a frying pan. And then when he lost his sight, he lost his, he didn't just lose his sight, he lost his, the ability to do the things the way he'd always done them. And to a certain extent, he lost his mojo as well. But for the last eight years, he has been um, helping people tirelessly to regain confidence in the kitchen after they'd lost sight. I have to say he's he's probably the person who's been on the show most because I just love him helping people who can't see very well, like myself, cook without using the eyesight, with their eyesight. His vivid descriptions of testing texture, uh, listening for bubbling pots, uh, the aromatic smells of spices as they heat up on the bottom of the frying pan, uh, and, and also his underlying mission 
to say you can't necessarily do things the way you did but there are ways to get around these things and you know food is so important particularly providing food for your friends and family and if you lose your sight you know you're worried that a you'll burn cut or bang yourself and b that what you produce isn't necessarily if the if the way uh the, to the stomach is through the eyes then you know you can understand why people who have lost sight may have lost confidence in uh in their ability in the kitchen and and some curl up into a ball so i think his as i say to him every time he comes on i say well first of all i say how do you cut an onion and the answer is cut it down the middle through the root and the tip place it face down on the chopping board take the skin off it at that point and then because your onion is face down you've got a stable surface and also sharp knife or blunt knife tony sharp knife sharp knife sharp knife a a sharp knife is much safer than a blunt knife um if you hurt yourself with a blunt knife it's going to hurt a lot more than if you do with a sharp knife so it's amazing to have him on um because of his positivity his joy his wonderful descriptions of cooking but also i think that's the one bit where we have managed to achieve the brief which is um to to try and provide people with practical advice that can make a difference to their life and i think again as much as the physical chopping and preparing and and boiling and a medium or cooking on a medium heat rather than a high heat and not worrying too much about how things look because the people you're feeding love you so they're not going to be worried that's been great but also the emotional support and the the, the constant message that you you can do what you've always done you may have to do it slightly differently that's all and that's uh you touched on it regarding the messaging of your show as well so the messaging of your show um regardless of, of who you're speaking to whether it be um somebody with blindness or, you know down the next side street or somebody in a completely different part of the world like nigeria the message is still you know blind or low vision you can still live the life that you choose. You can still um, do things that you want to do, but you obviously have to, well, you might have to find different ways to do it. Um, how do you, how do you feel when you are, when you're asking people uh, what their life is like from a blindness and low vision perspective, how do you find the reception that you get from the different people you're speaking to? It's interesting. So I, I had no contact with the blindness or low vision community. I touched on that thing before where, um, you know, my, my mum in the 1970s had a choice between mainstream education or uh, somewhere a bit more specialised. So actually, I didn't really come across too many people with vision impairments until my daughters were born. So they were both, uh, we, thought, we thought my eyesight condition was male only. We proved twice on one day with Charlotte and Elizabeth that in fact, it could also be passed down to females. So, so they, Charlotte was up for her first operation when she was five weeks old. And along the way, the head of non-medical services at Great Ormond Street Hospital, the famous children's hospital in London. Um, now, my, Paula, uh, Paula Netley, who we now refer to as my hospital girlfriend, uh, she taught me a lot. So this is about seven years before I got this job. And actually, I used what she said in the job interview. She said um, that basically, I mean, Paula's attitude is... is incredibly impressive she's famous for her, her her dog greg who's about the size of a horse and she doesn't have a white cane she has an electric pink cane and it's her job to coach parents um through uh 
through through the difficulty of having children with a vision impairment and all the hospital visits and trying to explain to them what it'd be like and arranging counselling and that kind of stuff. It's a very long-winded way of answering your question, Jordan, but she taught me something that I used in the job interview because it was a sentence she said to me. And then as the show has gone on in the last 18 months or so, and, and you've heard me use it, it's, it's gained more m meaning. And she said, number one, I am a, a wife and a doting mother. Number two, I am a national health service um, professional. Number three, uh, I ride horses quite a lot and I do three day, day eventing. Number four, I love to cook for my friends. Maybe when we get to number five, we can talk about my eyesight or lack thereof. Uh, and that's something that I, I came into, uh, as I say, I, I answered a question in the job interview with that. And then I was suddenly standing in front of people with a microphone. I've been a radio producer since I was 22, 23 years old, which is more than half a lifetime away for me. And then suddenly, I had to ask people just what exactly the nature of their sight condition was. And that frightened the poop out of me. Um, and again, we've had, uh, there's kind of a shorthand where I go, you know, I can at least say first, I am severely sight impaired. If you walk past me in the street, I wouldn't recognize you. Uh, I had to stand up next to the blackboard when I was a kid at school and never lend me your car keys. Uh, then, and it's been that way since birth and the condition is stable. Now, how about you? And at that point, I've asked somebody a question that they wouldn't necessarily normally want to answer. Um, but I've been amazed at how eloquent and kind and open uh, people on the other end of that question have been, and it's blown me away. I mean, some some weeks, to be honest with you, if we've got somebody on who is uh, a disability rights lawyer to talk about something to do with disability, or if we've got a judge on to talk about a story in the news, or if we've got a journalist on, I sometimes try and get through the whole interview without referring to the uh the the impairment um because that's the way it should be it's like it, the I, i'm all these things and an expert in this and i happen to have to make some compromises in my life and work around some stuff because i can't see very well or not at all so um the answer to your question in short is i've been blown away by how open people have been. Uh, I also started off asking all the wrong questions. Again, that sentence that has become a mantra is everyone's experience is different. But I haven't had anybody refuse to answer that question uh, or actually to be upset about it. it, it in some ways, it's actually harder. We've done a couple of shows on being a parent to a kid with vision impairment. And in some ways, asking parents about their children's vision impairments has been harder than uh, asking people about their their own. And again, the kids are the kids are all pretty tough, and they're living in their own world, so they don't mind when you ask. That's a that's a very good point, and I suppose having the perspective that you two have does make that question go down a little bit less like a lead balloon, I suppose. You know what? You've just reminded me of something. There was an incident. And when you use the word perspective in that sentence, um, there are those, Jordan, who would accuse you of using ableist language by doing that because perspective is purely a visual reference. And I met one such person and I'm not very good with them. Um, and 
it was a lady who it was a, a human rights advocate in the United States, and she was blind and deaf, and a lady of color. And uh, we were talking, and there was a lot of delay in the conversation. So I asked her from a practical point of view before the interview start, started. Um, uh, are you listening to me or are you reading me? And she said, well, actually, after, after a sub substantial pause, she said, actually, I've got a, a text to speech program, uh, a speech to text program that is taking in your words, converting them to text and then passing it on to me on a Braille reader. She said, I can turn it off. That's what that cracking noise is. I can turn it off if you want. And then I said, oh, no, don't worry about it. It adds a little color to the conversation. At which point she tore me a new one for not only using the word color, which was ableist and visual and asking me to change my language, uh, but also because she was a lady of color in mid 2020 in North America. So I used entirely the wrong word. And suffice it to say, the, the interview went on for about another five minutes before she decided that she was going to leave uh, and wished me a very nice day. So, yeah, I mean, the, I, I, I do have to say that I, I have encountered some difficulty with that, but every, every, I'm not here to give my opinion. I'm here to provide other people with a platform. So as far as I can, I, I let people say what they want, if you know what I mean. Yes. Uh, has there been, from the people that you've interviewed, has there been some personality uh, traits that you've admired? Has anyone stick out for you as far as uh, personality traits that you've admired? Um, again, uh, I, I start the answer with everybody's experience of blindness or low vision is different because I have to. But it turns out that as a group, there is a high, higher number of people than average who were quite good at language and, and quite good at sound and music. Uh, I would also say that I haven't half met some stubborn people over the last year or so. Oh, sorry, persistent, that's the word I'm looking for, isn't it? Uh, but yeah, the, there, is, there is a certain amount of stubbornness Although also, I mean, I think I've learned myself to be a little bit less ashamed of asking for help or catching a lift in this country that is entirely dominated by the car, which is not an option for me. Um, but as I say, most people that I've met, and again, I have to be careful not to be frankly racist here, but I've found people to be kind, intelligent, sensitive um and yeah stubborn i, I think I, i'm gonna ask you jordan uh, you you're asking some very nice open questions but you've helped me out in the last little while you have a superpower um which you, you, you you're very good at getting guests is there anybody that you've enjoyed meeting or listening to the on any of the shows where we've worked together well i mean i've enjoyed listening to all of them i don't think there's been any that i've thought to myself geez i wish i could turn this great i wish i could turn this off um i i, I do want to talk a little on sanford greenberg if mm. we may hello darkness uh, my old friend <laughs> so you you uh had the privilege of interviewing sanford uh, for those who haven't heard of sanford greenberg sanford greenberg talks about how he's received help with other people and completely brushes over the fact that he's been one of the most successful people around like it was nothing and that he wouldn't have been able to do it without help uh, so, I think as far as personality traits go, there is a lot to like about somebody with that level of achievement who wants to talk about 
others? It was interesting. So if you, my reference to Hello Darkness, my old friend, um, Sanford Greenberg was born in uh, Connecticut, I think in 1940. Um, and he then went to university in New York at the age of 20, where he met his roommate, uh, Arthur Garfunkel of Paul Simon and Arthur Garfunkel fame. And that's the, that's the headline. That's the, that's the thing that everybody goes for. Oh, look, it's, it's Art Garfunkel's best mate who probably helped influence the title of Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, uh, and was in the kindest light the inspiration for the writing of that song. Um, and I said to him at the beginning of this thing, I said, Mr. Greenberg, I, I'm very aware that in the 1960s you founded your own company, uh, that you built computers that went aboard the Apollo moon programs, that you uh, are the chairman of the Johns Hopkins University ophthalmology department, that you have chaired the uh, uh, the Congressional Committee on US Sino Relations. If you don't want to talk about Art Garfunkel, we don't have to. Um, and the story was that uh, Art Gump Garfunkel had met him and in a moment had decided that he and Art were going to be friends for life. And uh, he, he and Sandy were going to be friends for life. And Sandy Greenberg is incredibly humble about this. Uh, and speaks very eloquently about the beautiful friendship that developed and particularly the help that Art Garfunkel gave to Sandy Greenberg uh, to, that's the dog, uh, to help him uh, get back on his feet when he lost his sight at the age of 21. And if you do, if you, if you do use the interwebs, I can highly recommend uh, searching Studio One, uh, Sandy Greenberg, and listening to the podcast. Not because of me, because of the well, I think the humbling humility is is the tautology I'm going to use of this incredibly wise and intelligent and spiritual man. Um, and his life story, which at his heart had a 50 year marriage and a beautiful friendship with somebody of whom we all have an image. So it's very interesting. I, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, Jordan, but I'm not, I'm not a, a, a man of religion or spirituality, but we've had a couple of interviews recently and I think the Cobham's a software one that's going out tomorrow, and Sandy Greenberg, where people who have been through a lot talked about their spirituality. And I'm English. Uh, we don't discuss religion or politics. But I have to say that in both cases, uh, I was deeply moved um by these people and how they had um the spiritual element of their lives was so important to them and they hadn't just come across it as a teenager in something that had been built up over years of fighting frankly again that maybe that goes back to um another another element of what, what do people have in common? Everyone's experience of blindness with low vision is different, but there's a certain amount of stubbornness that I've mentioned already, but actually more than that, if we, if we look at it more carefully and quietly and contemplatively, it's a group of people who have had to overcome struggles of one, to one degree or another and yeah I, I think most of the people i met are fighters which is really interesting not what I, not what i was expecting coming in from the outside at all 
So it, it sounds a lot like a lot of these people have surprised the hell out of you when you have met them. Um, and I suppose a lot of these people too would be interviewed by other people that don't ask those questions. Um, I'd like to probably ask the question regarding without cheapening the interview, but asking bucket list interviews for you. Ones that I haven't, uh, that I've had already or ones that, that ones that you've that walked that away from and gone, from. that was fantastic radio. I'm proud to have been a part of that. Well, again, uh, uh, I, 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 you're only as good as your last show. And the one I did last week with Tony Broom, uh, as I say, he, he inspires me. Cobham's a so called uh, the Nigerian singer was awesome. Uh, and as I say, he, he was one of the people who took me down a route I wasn't expecting to go down, quite a spiritual one. But you know what? Being able to speak, there are, I can talk about audiobooks to people more. I've discovered the joy of audiobooks recently, and, and uh, uh, David Woodbridge, Vision Australia's uh, a technology, uh, accessible technology specialist, I managed to lead him astray and get him to talk about uh, science fiction novels. Uh, and, and, and audiobooks are totally different in the way you experience them to, to books. And if you remember that, that when I spoke to Casey Harris, the, the, the headline rock and roller, actually we had quite an insightful conversation about um, uh, Stephen King and his use of teenage Americana in his books and how he vividly paints a picture of uh, growing up as a teenager, even though he's lost his sight. Um, uh, I, I, I found those to be amazing. Also, just an occasional bit of banging the table, a bit of um, thumping the table and having a whinge with people. Uh, we did a show called Where's My Bleeping Autonomous Car? Uh, about when can we expect our cars to come and pick us up from our home, deliver us to the supermarket and bring us back again. Um, uh, there, it's actually, everybody, you think an emotional conversation is going to be difficult, but it's actually really nice to share those bits of joy with people as well. So we do have a question from Carol. Carol wants to know, uh, can you provide some examples of some amazing women that you've had on the show? Hi, Carol. Um, well, I started off with Nas, who's great. Uh, Nas Campanella, the ABC reporter. Jess Gallagher blew me away. Again, I, uh, she is the uh, Olympic gold, uh, Paralympic gold medalist who actually makes her way, makes her living in life as an osteopath. And it was, how do you... Um, uh, how, how do you study to be an osteopath? You imagine them sitting there in a lecture theatre and big slides on the screen um, or watching people manipulate. And Jess, who, again, strikes me as somewhat strong-headed, um, she made sure that she got to go up to the front and touch everything so she could find out what she's doing. And she now makes a living as an osteopath. But my favourite, 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 Carol, uh, has to be uh, the CEO of Blind Citizens Australia, Emma Benison. Um, she was incredibly supportive. Uh, she knew I was going to find it harder than I thought it was. And I've interviewed her now for three full half hour shows. And in fact, some of them go on longer. Um, and uh, one of the things that intrigues me is the link between mental health and vision impairment. When I started off, I was a little clumsier than I am now. And uh, I said, can being vision, sure, hold on two seconds, Jordan. The blooming dog is trying to take over. I'm just going to slam a door. Hold on. I don't know. Don't never work with children or animals. 
But Emma is amazing and incredibly knowledgeable and incredibly wise. And I started off clod hopping around going, uh, can uh, being low vision or blind make you, can it, can it, can it increase the risk of mental health problems? Uh, can it make you a bit bonkers? And she very even handedly answered my question and guided me through uh, her own experience and my experience. I have to say, uh, I always introduce her as she's a, she's a, she's a mum and a high powered exec executive. Um, but she's also a really lovely human being. She's, um, uh, she honestly, I, I, one day I hope to go down to Hobart and buy her a glass of wine um, because she has led by example, been incredibly tolerant and has really affected me and, and taught me. And again, we also had Paula on from uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital, who is the woman who got me this job in the first place, frankly. Uh, and I've learned a lot from her as well also can i just give a shout out to my mum and all of the other mums of people who live with vision impairment these 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 women are minding their own business having a life anticipating all the difficulties of having a child with a vision impairment or just having a normal child and and you know painting the nursery and and building the cot and choosing the pram and doing all this and then to have um, the, the whole thing that your child has a, an eyesight condition thrown into that, your baby, your, your newborn child, to be able to cope with that and turn it around is fantastic. And, and in that, I will, I, will, I will give an honorable mention to A-list Conrad. Um, and very honourable mentions to my mother and to my wife, Maretta, because they've all been through it. And yeah, they're much better at it than we blokes are. And I guess what you were, um, some of your shows have focused heavily on parenting um, people with low vision or, or blind children. I think I've, the general the general feel around those shows is that most of the people that you've spoken to didn't have a lot of awareness around what it was like to parent a blind or low vision child and having resources like your show to kind of go through some of the other people's experiences, I think would have been quite benefit beneficial. Would you agree? Yeah, I would. Strangely, when you've got a, uh, I speak from experience, when you've got a five week old child under general anesthetic, having their eyes sliced open, it's quite a busy afternoon, it's quite a busy time of your life. And you don't necessarily, it's quite isolated and you don't necessarily have the energy or the inclination to go and find a self help group to talk to about that because you're too busy dealing with the issue um so yeah i mean this is this is the interesting thing i, I was hired jordan to do a national talk back show so the idea of a phone-in program where people would ring up every week with their issues and questions and, and opinions on topic of the day uh and um, yes, the information in that show uh, is quite, in those shows, is, is quite useful, I hope, to other people. But at the same time, I'm not convinced that we're reaching a wide enough audience yet. And I think that's partly because... Um... Do you mind? Uh, that's partly because... Um... Well, I, I, sometimes I can't tell. I think... Uh, I, I think. Well, on that, that thought, um, Matt, if, I, if I might the sort of... The reticence of some of our audience to step forward means that we haven't had as much interaction as we'd like. Um, uh, I think a live phone-in programme would have been impossible. 
and uh, I read out the, the phone number and the email address for the show at the beginning and the end of each episode. And we invite interaction on promos on Vision Australia Radio many, many times a week. But to be honest, the direct audience interaction has been, uh, well, I think by, by nature, if we're going to go to the, the, the stubborn and the fighter and the quite good at listening to music and language, if there's another common thread, perhaps it's uh, that we can be a bit quiet sometimes. And part of what I'd like to do here today is, is actually get a bit of feedback, if possible, if anybody's, I don't know how many people in, 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 in this webinar have actually heard Studio One. It may be a good idea for you to, to, to ask, Jordan. Can you get people to do a show of hands while I'm rabbiting and report back to me? I, yeah, definitely. Um, I'm but, unsure of what the... the uh, uh, other. Watch this, I'll do it. If, if you've actually heard Studio One on Vision Australia Radio, please can you press Alt and H or press the hand up button and, and make a little comment saying yes or no, and let's get a rough idea of what's going on. <laughs> uh, there you go. Lucky you got a professional in, Jordan. <laughs> um, uh, but, but I'm really desperate. My, my remit is to get the voices and, and stories and struggles of vision-impaired people on the radio. And at the moment, uh, I and, and occasionally with the big names, you have been going out to find people to interact with us. Uh, I am hoping that... Again, this is, you know, it, it's, it's not my show at all. The idea is uh, I implore people every week to get in touch because their stories on the topics we're talking about, their experiences and insight may be of use to somebody else listening. I think that's what we try and do. So I would roundly please encourage you if you if you have if you haven't listened please have a listen if you like what you hear or think it could be improved please let us know if there's something you think we should be talking about that you maybe have experience of or that is winding you up please let us know but yeah it's um uh i i think i think in general trying to get these messages out there um I, I, I can't do it on my own um, and and I need help opening up the discussions around the show and the topics we talk about. Final question, Matt, because I know we're getting close to time. Where can people find you? Nah, Studio One airs on Vision Australia Radio uh, at three o'clock in the afternoon in places like uh, Darwin and Perth uh, on D DAB Digital Radio on medium wave in Adelaide, on FM in Melbourne, so old-fashioned radio knob twiddly stuff. Um, if you go onto social media, you can find us on the Vision Australia Facebook page, which uh, where you can, the Vision Australia Radio Facebook page, where you can listen to the show or click a button to find the podcast apparently they're reasonably accessible or wherever you get your podcasts as the proper radio people say uh yeah three o'clock in the afternoon is wednesday uh uh except for adelaide where for some reason we're on at eight o'clock at night um but yes yeah, so, so we're on the radio every week and i encourage you to get in touch with us uh using the email address which is studio one at vision australia.org i can be found on twitter at twitter.com slash whinging pom or if it's easier, please use this forum as a channel to approach me. I'm sure that uh, Jordan uh, and Rebecca, who has facilitated this meeting, will be keen to uh, help pass on your details to me. Uh, I, I, would, I would love to, as I say, A, get feedback, tell me what I'm doing wrong, and, and B, talk about the things that are important to you. Matt, for people in New South Wales using internet, do you know the website for your podcasts? Uh, yes. Uh, as I said, funnily enough, 
uh, the easiest way to do it is uh, to go to twitter.com forward slash VA Radio Network. And all of the latest shows by me and by the other great talented people at Vision Australia Radio will be there. If that's easy for you, that's good. Again, iTunes, Google or Spotify, search for Vision Australia Studio One and you can find me there. No dramas. Okay, perfect. Well, at this point in time, I'd like to let you know that we did have some hands up. We had three hands up saying that they listened to your show. Uh, we had a no on the chat from Carolyn, uh, who's going to look you up because it looks like she said thank you for that as well. Um, look, at this point in time, I'd like to thank our guest, Matthew Layton, for, uh, for chatting to us on this webinar. And uh, I, if you haven't listened to Studio One, I definitely encourage you to go and have a bit of a listen uh, in signing off in his fashion, remembering your story could uh, and can really make a difference and really help people that have going through the same thing. So uh, definitely get in touch. Thank you for your time, Matthew. I appreciate it. No, thank you, Jordan. Really appreciate it. And um, yeah, again, it's that thing just quickly is, is if you it, it, remember what it was like when you were a teenager, if you were born with a vision impairment, or if you lost sight um, at, at the age of 50, uh, imagine what that's like for somebody who's going through the same thing. And those are the kind of things we would, would like to help people with. Especially while we're all in lockdown as well. Uh, they are quite entertaining. So definitely go and check that out. Uh, Matthew, thank you once again for all your time and yeah, for sure. your uh, generosity with it. Uh, we're all, as I said, in lockdown at the moment, so we can all use a bit of entertainment. Vision Australia. Blindness. Low vision. Opportunity. opportunity. Vision Australia logo. Three navy blue ovals linked together diagonally within a bright yellow rectangle.